and uh, hello to the groups doing the course not on a Tuesday. It's good to have you with us too. Um, tonight, everybody, we're looking at this topic of prayer, um, which is a pretty important foundation for our lives as Christians. Um, it's interesting when Archbishop Philip and I were trying to come up with what our dual Episcopal vision was going to be going forward for this next little while. Um, we were pretty unanimous in deciding that number one had to be a focus on prayer. Prayer, if you like, is the foundation upon um, our lives for how we, how we live um, each day. So um, for that reason, really, I guess prayer is an important part of the lift journey. Um, and it's important that we're spending tonight um, reflecting on it together. Um, but before we, we get into that, I um, just want to start by doing what we'll do at the start of every session, and that is spending a bit of time thinking about the material from last week and what your reflections have been about this material during the week. So you'll recall last week we spent some time thinking about um, uh, the theme of journeying, of pilgrimage, and we looked at a couple of uh, biblical passages and images around that, and then a couple of uh, more contemporary reflections on the theme of pilgrimage. Um, and then we spent some time thinking about what this, this journal writing is about. What does it mean to um, keep a journal? So um, let's spend um, about 10 minutes just now, if you like, together reflecting on your learning from last week and what... What questions have you been left with during the week and what are the things that have really stood out for you? Um, you might even also want to share a reflection on, on how the start of your own journal writing journey um, is going and what that has um, brought up for you. So I will um, check back with you in about 10 minutes. So if, if you've got a, a local timekeeper um, where you are... Um, if you can keep an eye on the clock, um, and I'll be back with you in about 10 minutes. Okay, good reflecting. Let's get on to um, the, the main course, if you like, for tonight, which is um, thinking and reflecting about prayer. came across a quote um, online the other day from um, a lady called Corrie ten Boom. I, I don't know if any of you come across um, her. She was a Dutch Christian woman who, um, amongst many other things, um, helped the Jews, many Jews, escape the, the Holocaust during the Second World War. But she, she, she wrote quite a lot about her life, and I came across a quote about prayer in which she says, Is prayer your steering wheel? or your spare tyre. <laughs> um, and I think, that's, I think that's a really good one. It's, it's caused me to, to pause and ponder a lot during the week. Is, is prayer my steering wheel, the thing that is always at the forefront of, of guiding me in whatever direction I'm going in? Or is it the spare tyre that comes out um, when I'm a bit flat and need a boost? So you can, you can ponder that um, during the week. Um, let's start off then with um, three quotes um, about prayer. So the first one is by Archbishop Desmond Tutu from his book, An African Prayer Book. And he says this, We are a remarkable paradox, the finite made for the infinite, the time bound with a nostalgia for the transcendent, the eternal. It has been said that we each have in us a God-shaped space, and only God can fill it. Our natural milieu is the divine, and that is why one great African saint and father of the church, Augustine of Hippo, could assert in words that are widely quoted, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. <laughs> I think, I think why I think possibly why he might need to mute your microphone. Why he are you able to mute your microphone? Because we we're hearing a lot of what you're saying. Thank you. No. 
I'm having my like, eye problem, so I'll have to just put in many again and try again because well, I've decided that it doesn't work for me. Keep, keep on working through your workbook um, if you can. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys. It's just. Right, very good. Well, hopefully why he will rejoin us. But um, so that's Archbishop Desmond Tutu's um, quote. Then um, Archbishop Justin Welby um, says this, if we want to see things changed, it starts with prayer. It starts with a new spirit of prayer, using all the traditions, ancient and modern. When it comes, it will be linked to what has gone before, but it will look different because it is a renewal for new times. God's created community is perfectly designed for its time and place. It almost always comes from below. It comes from Christians seeking Christ. So that's something about the desire in each one of us to connect with God and the importance of prayer in making that connection real. And also acknowledging something of the, the link that we have in, in our prayers with Christians that have prayed in the generations previous and a sense of um, the way in which prayer will be held we hope into the future um, and finally um, from the Benedictine um, writer um, Lawrence Freeman um, he says this prayer is not informing God of our needs or asking God to change his mind we are setting up our will in opposition to God's will or willing God what he should be doing. Such, and he calls it egocentric prayer, fosters many forms of neurotic religious behaviour, such as praying for victory over others, or the fulfilling of our own or our egotistical desires. Absurdity of this kind begins by creating a God in our own ego, our own image. So that's quite a... Um, provocative quote which you might want to reflect on um, in your discussions in a little while basically saying that um, prayer is shouldn't be about um, us and our own needs and, and the way we want things to be um, it's it's something more than that it's hard sometimes obviously not to pray for things in the way that we want them to be for example when we pray for people to get well um, but we need to acknowledge that prayer is more than simply that. That's inevitably part of it, but it's more than that. So these three different quotations um, perhaps lay out what might be described as some very basic understandings of what prayer is, and particularly why we pray. It's possibly a good way to think about it, not just what is prayer, but actually why is it um, that, we, that we do pray. Prayer is conversation with God. Um, we pray because we are in relationship with God, and that, that word relationship is really quite key. The desire for and need for prayer is constant and must be renewed in every generation. Prayer is not a shopping list. I think that's what Lawrence Freeman is kind of getting at. It's not a shopping list of what we want read out to God. Um, and that although we make intercession, um, we do pray for people and for situations but in doing that, I think we also evoke God's will and our acceptance of that. Um, not our own desire for things to be the way that we want them to be, because we know that sometimes when we pray for something, we don't necessarily get the outcome that, that we wanted or that we expected. When we pray ourselves or when we listen to prayer, we know that in some way God's presence is being acknowledged and invoked. And that's part of the relationship thing too. You know, to be in relationship with somebody means that you've got to acknowledge their presence. You can't talk to somebody, you can't talk to the person next to you without somehow acknowledging that, that they exist, that they're there. And because they're there, that will begin to affect who you are as well as you begin that journey of relationship. Um, when we hear the call for Kalakia, we know that God's blessing is being asked for. So God's presence is being invoked in a particular situation or environment. And so in that sense, prayer and karakia both speak about the very essence of what it is to be human. That all of us and all of our environment, so everything about our context, 
is bound up in this relationship between God and human beings. There's no division of sacred and secular and everything, every situation, every place, every being belongs to God. So we'll look um, in a little while at something about the heritage of prayer, um, but it's often quite good to, to begin by acknowledging and thinking about um, a prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. It's kind of the prayer to begin all prayers in many ways, if you like, and that is, of course, the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, um, Jesus taught them the Lord's Prayer. And there are two different versions of the Lord's Prayer, slightly different from one another, um, in Matthew and Luke. And it's worth noting that with the Lord's Prayer, um, Jesus commands the disciples to pray in this way. He doesn't kind of say, well, if you feel like it, you, can, you might want to pray these words. Um, Jesus actually, and it's pretty, it's pretty noticeable in the Greek in the New Testament at this point, this is a, a definite command. Um, it's not an option, it's a command. So in that sense, prayer is um, active and it takes work and effort on our part. It's a command. And then um, the other thing, um, particularly if you look at um, Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, is that how the teaching around the Lord's Prayer is accompanied by the story about the friend who arrives at, at midnight. So um, if you get a moment this week, have a read of all of that, all of those verses to, to kind of get a sense of how the Lord's Prayer fits in with, with what is around it and what you think is being said to us about prayer by putting it next to this rather amusing story of the friend who arrives at midnight. Um, in his comments on the Lord's Prayer in Luke's Gospel, so Luke's version, um, Mick King, um, who the, the author of a translation of the New Testament, observes that the disciples regard Jesus' teaching as a bit puzzling, but as something that they ought to do, and that Jesus ought to teach them to do. The parable of the friend at midnight teaches us actually what prayer is like. It is a relationship between friends who will cheerfully give other friends what they need. There are three friends in the parable, the one in bed, the one who wants bread and the one who has been on a journey. And the repetition of the word might seem a bit clumsy until we realise what Luke is doing. The key to prayer is friendship. So Nick King says that God is therefore a drinks dispenser, which discharges the appropriate substance when the appropriate coin is inserted and the right button pressed. Sorry, God is not therefore a drinks dispenser. I think I said God is a drinks dispenser. <laughs> I mean, God is not a drinks dispenser. <laughs> We should note that Jesus uses quite powerful active verbs for talking about prayer. Ask, seek, find. These suggest that we are supposed to take an initiative in prayer and present our needs. Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer is all requests. Although, of course, we may always have to recognise that God may know better than we do what we need. It's generally often the case. I think God knows more than we do what we need. Um, now, of course, um, as Anglicans, we place a lot uh, of prominence on our prayer book. Um, we are a people of the book, uh, the Bible, as well as um, our prayer book. And we, in a sense, pray what we believe and we believe what we pray. And it's a really important part of our Anglican identity. Um, and while a lot of prayer can be informal and um, ad hoc or off the cuff with something like our prayer book when we articulate um, a rhythm of prayer together um, we're actually saying something important about who we are as a people of God um, and remember who we are as a people of God in, in our context is as a three Tikana church so we acknowledge the different languages the different cultures and nations that make up our Anglican context um, in this part of the world as Anglicans, we hold to the phrase, this is the Latin phrase, lex orandi, lex credendi, what we pray, we believe, and we often add to that lex vivendi, which means so we live. 
So our prayer book therefore contains our beliefs, our doctrines, and so its words are crafted with immense care. It took quite a lot of uh, liturgical committee meetings, etc., to come up with this, and as Anglicans, of course, we like our committee meetings. Um, but this is definitely a work of, of labour and care, um, and that is why for us it is a tanga, it is something um, precious in how we articulate our faith. Um, in John Pritchard's book, um, How to Explain Your Faith, um, he has a few quotations about prayer, and they are, prayer uh, is keeping company with God, St. Cyril of Alexandria. Prayer enlarges the heart until it is capable of containing God's gift of himself. That's St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Archbishop Rowan Williams describes prayer in some way helps us to thin out the fabric of the world or opens the door of opportunity for the action of God to come through. I rather like that image of thinning out the fabric of the world. And then uh, Archbishop, um, Bishop John rather describes uh, Peggy Noonan, who was a speechwriter for Presidents Reagan and Bush Senior in 1998. She found herself writing as a journalist about what she called the terrible big thing that she believed was on its way. And this was before the events of 9-11 that traumatised the nation. This is some of what she wrote. So be good, do good, and pray. When the Virgin Mary makes her visitations, and she's never made so many in all of recorded history as she has this century, she says, pray, pray, unceasingly. Quite honestly, I think Peggy says, I myself don't. <laughs> that might apply to many of us. Um, but I think about it a lot and sometimes pray when I think. But you don't have to be a Roman Catholic to take this advice. Pray unceasingly. Take the time. So in your local groups now, if you take, um, uh, let's say, uh, five minutes, um, just to share with another some of your responses to these very um, initial reflections on what prayer is. Share with one another what your understanding of prayer is. Okay, um, perhaps if you have a, a, a moment this week, you might like to just take a look at those two different versions of the Lord's Prayer, Luke and Matthew. Um, <clears throat> what similarities and differences um, do you notice between the two versions? And that will connect us a little bit with when we get to the Gospels and we think a little bit more about the similarities and differences between the Gospels. So uh, if you notice similarities and difference, just, just notice that and we'll come back to that. Um, when we get to session five. <clears throat> so let's think just a little bit now about the, the heritage of prayer. So um, the sense of, of history, if you like, that, that, that we bring as part of our, our journey as Christians now um, with, with what has gone before us. Um, obviously, if we were to think about the entire history of prayer, that would take um, multiple uh, weeks. So um, it's, it's pretty difficult to do it in just a few minutes, but um, we'll touch on a, a couple of things that are quite worth noting. Um, in Jesus' day, um, what might be called as the great prayer book, if you like, Jesus' main prayer book, if you like, would have been the Davidic Psalter, so our Psalms. Um, that would have been a kind of go-to prayer resource, if you like, for, for Jews in Jesus' day. And alongside this, there were many prayers stemming from different religious um, communities, and many of these prayers are recorded um, in the Bible, specifically, of course, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, um, as maybe most it's appropriate to describe it. Um, but there's also examples of prayers in other um, types of ancient literature, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, <clears throat> which um, are this collection of documents discovered at Qumran in the Holy Land in the 1940s. Um, these are documents of a Jewish sect who lived at Qumran, and they give us our earliest known manuscript versions of the books of our Old Testament. And, and those particular documents range and date from the period of the 5th century BC right up to quite late, actually around the 4th century um, AD, so covering quite a, um, a, a range of time. <clears throat> 
Now, interestingly, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls tell us that the beginning and the end of the day, of each day, was celebrated by saying special prayers. The end and the beginning of each week um, was heralded by the Sabbath services in the home, synagogue, temple and other religious gatherings. The year began at Rosh Hashanah, so the new year, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the special prayers and psalms. And the year was also divided by great festivals such as Passover. And interestingly and significantly for, for us today, um, Jewish time was, if you like, liturgical time. So the day was, was interspersed and marked with prayer. And the whole year, if you like, was held in a rhythm of prayer and seasonal um, observance. So the, the year, if you like, was, was soaked or bathed in the, the context of prayer. So it's like, if you imagine right now, sitting where you're sitting, and you are completely surrounded by the culture and the context of prayer. It is always there. And... A point to, to, to ponder really is, is to what extent can we still speak about the rhythm of our day and our year as being liturgical, as somehow set apart. Now, um, we do, albeit in a secular way, but we nonetheless it, here in New Zealand do pause to observe Easter and Christmas, for example. So even though in many ways these festivals are quite um, secularised, um, in the way that they're observed, sort of zoom in again, um, they are nonetheless part of how our year is, is observed and, and made up. We, we pause also um, at a time like Anzac Day, and it's interestingly how, how Anzac Day has taken on, it seems, even more and more of an um, overtly religious tone while somehow remaining um, secular. Although, if you go back to something I said at the beginning, maybe this divide between sacred and secular is, is actually not so pronounced. We, we, we try to make a separation between them, but actually, really, they're all enveloped um, together. So when you have opportunities like that, Christmas, Easter, Anzac, um, what opportunities might this give us to tell the story of our faith with more confidence? Yeah, that's something to maybe think about in a moment. Um, foundational for Jewish prayer were the daily prayers in the home. So the, the, the home life and, and the rhythm of, of the home was interspersed with prayer, particularly, um, interestingly, grace after meals, um, so not before, um, and the frequent prayers of the individual. And during Jesus' time, the Hebrew Bible, or our Old Testament, began to take on a more fixed or canonical form. And alongside this, the basic themes in Jewish liturgy were being normalised. And so we begin to get more formal prayers as well as informal prayers. So an analogy is you begin to get more of the sort of prayer book, um, common shared prayers than simply um, prayers that, that are informal. And significantly, Jewish prayers were not, um, unlike other cultures, Pleas for material possessions or rewards or kind of magical manipulation of a deity who could be controlled by special deeds or words. Um, interestingly, the author of Daniel has those three chaps in a rather tricky situation, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They confess that even if God would not deliver them, he was still their God. So their, their prayer, if you like, for some kind of assistance acknowledged that Okay, it might not work out as they wanted, but nonetheless, they still acknowledged that God was their God. Um, the first century Jewish historian uh, Josephus, in his uh, writing The Jewish War, which is an account of the revolt of the Jews against Rome in the year 66 to 70, which ended up with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, but Josephus describes how um, Jews resisted the Romans, particularly Pilate, and offered their lives in the refusal to compromise their law and their liturgical or their, their prayer customs. Jews lived out the conviction that God does hear and answer prayers. 
though not necessarily in the way we might want them to be answered. Psalm 116 says, I love the Lord, for he hears my voice. Please, for he inclines his ear to me whenever I call. So these are just a few kind of snapshots of something of the history and the heritage of prayer um, that forms and informs how we pray today. So um, just in your local groups, take, take a few minutes just, just to note what, what connections that you, you feel are between this sort of this heritage of, of prayer, which um, has been summarised here in, in quite a particular context, a Jewish context, the context that Jesus would have known. Um, and some of the connections that we may find with that um, today. So, you know, how is the shape of our year and our day still steeped in this religious heritage? Okay, so take, take a few minutes to reflect on that. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody. Um, now let's think a little bit about how to pray um, and there are lots of different ways in which we can pray and you might be able to share some of those um, in a moment. So John Pritchard says this, is there an easy way to pray? Yes and no. That's a very classic Anglican answer. Yes and no. No one ever truly encountered God without being scorched in some way. To take prayer seriously is to enter uncharted territory with a map that simply says, here be dragons. But the names of the dragons are the many names of love. And encountering love is, at heart, the most natural human activity. Think then of a human relationship of love like a close, close friendship. It has many expressions. And our Benedictine friend, Lawrence Freeman, says, Prayer is like a wheel with many spokes. The different spokes represent different forms of prayer. These can be explicitly religious, such as those we practice in church, or less obviously so, like walking, exercise, making music or art. Whatever concentrates our attention in a selfless way can be said to be a form of prayer. The fruit of all prayer is a calmer mind, and a more open and compassionate heart. So there are lots of different ways to pray. So in your local groups again just now, if you take, um, let's say, uh, let's do a quick fire round. Take three minutes to um, identify as many different forms of prayer as you can, and you can make a list. Okay, so go for it. Good, I hope you've got a, a good list um, of uh, different types of prayer and you can maybe make a note of those and add to it actually as, as, as the weeks go on. Um, in their introduction uh, to a book called Lift Up Your Hearts, Prayers for Anglicans, who knew there was such a book? There is. Um, Andrew Davison, Andrew Nunn and Toby Wright describe different prayers as the church's banquet. They say... When we pray, we learn to pray. As we pray, we enter into that rich experience of prayer which George Herbert describes in his poem in a series of metaphors that seek to describe this banquet or riches. Um, so George Herbert um, was a Welsh-born poet and an Anglican priest, um, 16th and early part of the 17th century, who's Legacy of poems are richly part of the Anglican tradition, giving voice to hymns like Teach Me, My God and King. And the poem that um, Davison, Nunn and Wright refer to um, is, uh, is this, and um, you've got to note the language it's of its time. Um, Prayer, the church's banquet, angel's age, God's breath in man returning to his birth, the soul in paraphrase, heart in pilgrimage, the Christian plummet sounding heaven and earth, engine against the almighty sinner's tower, reversed thunder, Christ's side piercing spear, the six days world transposing in an hour, a kind of tune which all things hear and fear, softness and peace and joy and love and bliss, 
exalted manner, gladness of the best, heaven in ordinary, man well dressed, the Milky Way, the bird of paradise, church bells beyond the stars heard, the soul's blood, the land of spices, something understood. Now that's um, a rather amazing array, a, a banquet of imagery if you like, and one thing that you might want to do in the week, if, if you can, is um, reflect on that and maybe add your own list of, of how and where you experience a sense of prayer. Um, you know, something like the Milky Way, I, I often experience a sense of connection to God in prayer um, through standing outside at night um, wearing lots of layers at the moment, it must be said, and a hat, um, looking up at the stars and just getting that sense of um, connection at being in the midst of God's universe. It's quite profound, actually. So you might come up with your own George Herbert-type poem or list of the different places, different types of prayer and images that you really resonate with about what, what it means to experience and encounter God's presence. Um, when we thought briefly um, just a few moments ago about the heritage of prayer, um, much of that seemed to be about words, okay? particularly if you look at our <coughs> prayer book. There's a lot of words in our prayer book. Um, and of course, another part of our Christian heritage um, are the writings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers from the 3rd and 4th centuries. Lawrence Freeman reminds us that they described prayer, um, and through this the related word um, meditation, um, they described prayer as the laying aside of thoughts. And Lawrence Freeman goes on to describe a practice of closing our eyes and repeating a single word or mantra over a period of time. And two of the oldest forms of simple prayer in this form um, are this. Firstly, the Aramaic word Maranatha, which is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, which means something like, Come, Lord Jesus. So simply repeating that word, Maranatha, over and over again. So you get into a sort of meditative rhythm doing that. So that's one form of, of uh, meditative prayer. And the other one, of course, is you may have heard of the Jesus prayer, which is used particularly in the Eastern churches. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Um, and while this, this one does contain few more words than just one word and the purpose is through simply repeating that phrase Lord Jesus Christ Son of God have mercy on me a sinner through repeating that again and again maybe even when you're out walking you don't necessarily have to be sitting still you could be praying as you walk praying that kind of prayer leads us into a deeper silence with God and remember that reference there to the, the encounter that Elijah had with God um, not in the earthquake or the whirlwind or the storm, but the still, small voice. So prayer is also about that still, small voice of encountering God. Um, now, John Pritchard, who um, uh, rather likes his lists, um, in his book 10, Why Christianity Makes Sense, he has 10 examples of ways to pray. So... Um, I'll just go over these um, just now so we can have just some discussion time as well. So first of all, trust your instincts. What are the things that call us to pray? What, what are the sorts of things that we encounter in our daily lives that by instinct we can call to mind in prayer? So that's one type of praying. Secondly, structure prayer, um, which he describes as some, sometimes helped by, again, we like our acronyms, um, ACTS, so adoration, confession, thanksgiving and supplication, or my personal favourite, TSP, thank you, sorry, please. So these are different ways of structuring prayer. You know, thanks God, sorry God, and please. <laughs> That's quite, quite a helpful one. Um, you can also spend time with the, with the Bible, with scripture each day, um, perhaps with uh, praying through one of the readings that comes up in the lectionary. And of course, in our prayer book, as a structured form of prayer, there are the orders of prayer for, for each day, for morning, for evening, for night prayer, which is how we finish our time together each week, and all different other types of prayer, um, which can be apportioned to the day and also to the, the, the point in the church year, the, the, 
um, the feast or the whatever time season that we're in at the moment. Um, and within all of these, there's an inner structure which in the Benedictine tradition is found in a cycle of eight intervals called hours. And one example given is a simple prayer for waking up. So literally when you, um, uh, when you wake up, um, there's a simple prayer here. Um, praise the Lord, O oh, oh my soul. Praise God's holy name. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. When in meditation at the start of your day, how will I look for God's glory today? And how will I help others see it? Then a prayer, come Emmanuel, come dwell with me, hope of the world and word of life. Come Emmanuel, come dwell with me. And then going out, praise the Lord, O my soul, praise God's holy name. So that's an example of just a sort of short um, structured prayer which you can use right at the start of your day as a way of commending, if you like, your whole day to God. Um, another form of prayer is through Lectio Divina, or holy reading, whereby we read a, a passage in the Bible slowly and prayerfully to encounter God in the process of that reading, rather than just racing through the passage at a speed of knots, actually slow down and read it closely. Um, then there's, that should be Ignatian, Ignatian meditation, <clears throat> which sort of builds, builds on the Lectio Divina idea, um, but this time as we read it, entering into it with all our senses, you know, so what do we see, smell, touch, hear, taste? So if you're reading something like the feeding of the 5,000, uh, for example, you can, you can imagine the smell of lots of bread and fish. <laughs> um, you can imagine the taste of that. Um, there are, there are, not every Bible reading is going to lend itself to 3D surround sound sensory experience, um, but be on the lookout for things that might just enter you, enter you and enable you to enter that in a prayerful way. Then there's uh, silence and centering prayer, and that can be using these a couple of these um, short forms of prayer that we looked at a moment ago. Um, there's something called the examen, which um, was uh, developed by Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order, um, which required the members of the order to use this way of prayer at the end of each day. So basically, how do you reflect on the day that has gone bef before you? What, what are your reflections and prayers stemming from that? Um, the portion of Living Faithfully that we've looked at for this week um, asked us to, to be attentive to God. So the, the examine, if you like, is about putting that into practice. How are we attentive to God in our day? Um, and then how, at the end of the day, what have we noticed about our day? What have we noticed? Where has God been? Um, then the idea of all of life as a prayer, um, and this is a kind of prayer uh, image, if you like, that's particularly found in something like the Celtic tradition, where there are prayers for everything, including, and this is quite good for, for rural Waikato and Taranaki, milking cows. How about that? And he's, here's the prayer for milking your cow. Bless, O God, my little cow. Bless, O God, my desire. Bless thou my partnership and the milking of my hands, O God. Bless, O oh God, each teat. Bless, O oh God, each finger. Bless thou each drop that goes into my pitcher, O oh God. It's a rather um, lovely prayer for milking your cows. So you can, <laughs> next time you're milking a cow, you, you come across somebody milking a cow, you can say, there's a prayer for that. Let me share that with you. Um, but it's about connecting all of life to prayer. You know, there's no part of life that is, is not involved in prayer. Um, then um, there's what John Pritchard describes as prayer with bells and whistles, um, something that might use other things as a stimulus, for example, music, such as a meditative Teze chant, um, or um, icons, for example, you know, a depiction or an artistic depiction that helps us to pray. Um, our whole bodies can be used to express prayer and praise. Even the simple act when you say the Lord's Prayer of outstretching your hands, just like that, that can be a powerful way of connecting our words with God's presence. There's prayer with others, um, and you might do that a little bit. Uh, well, you will do that on, on this lift course at the end of each evening. We, we finish the evening by praying together. 
Um, and in a sense, by doing that, um, we're acknowledging the presence and the needs of one another. So that's less about us and our needs and an acknowledgement that we're in a community. Um, and then, um, last but not least, the Eucharist. Um, and we don't often think of this as prayer, but, um, but the words that the priest says over the elements of the bread and the wine, all of that is called, of course, the Eucharistic prayer. That is a prayer. And the Eucharist itself contains all the elements of prayer, gathering, confessing, seeking forgiveness, listening to God's word, intentional bringing of petitions and thanksgivings to God, sharing the peace, giving thanks for all that God has done for us in Christ, sharing a meal, and then being sent forth. So, um, again, in another quick fire round, um, another three minutes, um, it, just in your local groups, um, just reflect together whether you've used any of these particular types of prayer or whether there's a particular type that, that really works for you, um, that, that you found useful, or maybe that you thought, well, I might give that one a go. Okay. A couple more things to... Uh think and reflect on before we finish our evening. Um, so let's, uh, let's just look at this quote from um, Davison Nunn and Wright in their book uh, Prayers for Anglicans. Um, and they, they say this, um, prayer certainly changes the world in one obvious way. It makes it a world in which people pray. This is a better sort of world one where we are more honest about our needs and our status as God's creatures. Whatever else we might say, it is right and fitting that we should commend ourselves and others into God's care. God wishes to draw us into his work. He gives us good things whether we pray or not. But when we do pray, he shares his work with us. So the point to ponder here is, does prayer change anything? Does prayer change anything? Okay, give yourselves three minutes to answer that one. Finally tonight, um, everybody, we're going to um, ponder quite a... Quite a weighty topic, actually. Nothing like leaving you with a weighty topic for the week. But um, I think it's a really important issue to, to think about, the challenge of prayer in our contemporary world. Um, and uh, interestingly, um, this, this quotation from Giles Fraser um, was originally published in the Guardian newspaper um, in March. Um, and the context for that was the... Uh, um, terror attack of the, the man that drove um, <coughs> over Westminster Bridge and um, immediately following that on social media particularly there was lots of sort of you know hashtag pray for London thoughts and prayers are with so on and so forth um, and interestingly in the recent events of uh, tragic events in Manchester overnight there's been a similar outpouring of thoughts and prayers are with but in this particular context, back in March, um, there was a pretty strong response against that tendency to put out thoughts and prayers from um, another newspaper columnist in, in England who, who said, can everyone stop all this hashtag pray for London nonsense? It's these stupid beliefs that help create this violence in the first place. So responding to that, Giles Fraser wrote his column in which he said... Prayer is not a way of telling God the things he already knows, nor is it some act of collective lobbying, whereby the Almighty is encouraged to see the world from your perspective if you screw your face up really hard and wish it so. Prayer is mostly about emptying your head, waiting for stuff to become clear. There is no secret formula. And holding people in your prayers is not wishful thinking. It's a sort of compassionate concentration where someone is deliberately thought about in the presence of the widest imaginable perspective, like giving them a mental cradling. But above all, 
prayer is often just a jolly good excuse to shut up for a while and think. The adrenaline that comes from shock does not make for clear thinking or considered judgment. Those who rush to outrage say the stupidest things. So, just in our um, concluding minutes before we come back and think about next week, um, have a little thought about what the challenge of prayer is in our contemporary world and in people, particularly people's um, attitudes towards prayer. What are some of the challenges that we face around that? Thanks, everybody. Um, you might want to note that uh, in this, in the period leading up to Pentecost, so I think starting on Thursday, actually, is um, the Archbishop of Canterbury has kind of called for a, um, a global wave of prayer, um, which is known as Thy Kingdom Come. So, and that's uh, one of the things I talked about last week when we about journaling was the idea of maybe doing a kind of prayer walk around your community. So, um, think of some of the ways in the next fortnight leading up to Pentecost that you can join in with that um, global prayer initiative, just that power of everybody um, praying, praying for, for transformation, for, for the world to be a better place, for the world to grow more closely to, to the image of God in which we are made. Now, next week, we begin our journey through the Bible, and next week, we're going to do the, the Old Testament, which is no mean feat to do in a week, uh, sorry, in a night, um, but your task this week is to look through the Old Testament. Note not to read the entire Old Testament between now and next Tuesday, because that would require a 24-hour readathon, which um, which nobody can do, but just basically... Um, have a look at the Old Testament, uh, get a feel for how it's structured, basically. Um, do some uh, journaling if you can, um, and have a read of the, the portion of Living Faithfully that um, I've set for the next week. And in this section, uh, um, Bishop John talks about nurturing friendships, and he provides quite a good overview of the biblical narrative. And one of the most important aspects of the Old Testament story is the creation of and the nurturing of new communities and all of the joys and challenges around that. So hold that in mind as we get ready to begin our journey through the Bible next week. And um, perhaps with a hint to the need to be mindful when we pray, um, the meditation from Stephen Cherry, uh, Breath, Breath of God, um, might inspire you uh, to always remember to breathe. <laughs> Very important. Um, thanks for your engagement tonight. Thanks for being with us. And um, we look forward to being together again uh, next Tuesday evening. So I'll bid farewell to New Plymouth. Bye, New Plymouth. I'll uh, bid farewell to Tokoroa. Bye, Tokoroa. Have a good week. Um, bid farewell to uh, Morinsville. You're next. Have a good week, Morinsville. And uh, say goodbye to Waihi. Great that you were able to make it back. Brilliant. Awesome. <laughs> and goodbye to Tamil Nui. Um, and finally, last but not least, a kakite ano to Vincent and Kathleen and their Fano. Good night. Oh, and a good night from... Uh, from, I don't think Dinsdale's with us. No, I don't think. Yes, well, Dinsdale, if you're there and you're not on the screen, hello and goodbye. <laughs> and it's a goodbye from us here in Charlotte Brown House. Good night. Okay.